Hello, I'm Dr. Ken Landau. Thanks for watching. Let's talk about Tamiflu. Tamiflu, or also Tamivir, is a pill used to treat the flu or to prevent the flu. Now, if it's taken within the first 48 hours of your developing symptoms of the flu, it might reduce the duration of the symptoms and it might reduce the severity of the symptoms. If you take it after 48 hours, there's no evidence that it will or it won't work. Prophylactically, if you're at risk for getting the flu, let's say you haven't had the vaccine flu season, you have some relatives who are infected with the flu, well, there's some evidence that it might prevent your developing the flu if you could take it for up to six weeks. Now, the flu season is going to last about 13 weeks. If you get the flu, it's going to last for about one to two weeks. Some people go and get the vaccine, think they're going to be protected, but that's not always the case. And as a matter of fact, in 2015, the flu vaccine only worked to prevent the flu in one out of four exposed people, so it wasn't very good. Each year, about 200,000 people are going to be hospitalized because of the flu. And somewhere between one in four and one in 20 people are going to get the flu every single year. The drug Tamiflu was originally developed by scientists at Gilead, and it was subsequently licensed to Roche. Roche had the drug in 1996, and it got licensing by the Food and Drug Administration in 1999 and became a generic just in late 2016. Now, it's not a substitute for the flu vaccine. You can take the drug with or without food, it's available in three oral strengths, or it's available as a suspension that can be mixed in the pharmacy. But if it's mixed in the pharmacy, the shelf life is only 10 days at room temperature or 17 days in the refrigerator. Or you can just get a capsule and dissolve the capsule in some chocolate syrup or some caramel topping. Now, if you're going to use this particular drug, the Tamiflu, you shouldn't be getting the intranasal live vaccine around the same time because obviously the Tamiflu is going to kill that. But it's okay if you get the inactivated vaccine that almost everybody who gets vaccinated is going to receive. Now, the question is, if we use the definition of time to resolution of all symptoms, is it going to work in everybody? The people who are at highest risk, obviously, are the people who have respiratory disease, heart disease, or are immunosuppressed. And it, it doesn't seem like it works very well in that group, the group at highest risk, the group who theoretically could do the best with the drug. If you take the Tamiflu, you might have some side effects, side effects like nausea or vomiting, headache or pain. You might have a rash that could be potentially serious, something known as the Stevens-Johnson syndrome or toxic epidermal necrolysis where your skin just seems to fall off. And especially in children, who have the flu and who take the Tamiflu, there's the risk of abnormal behavior, confusion, seizures, delirium, and there have been some deaths reported from these abnormal behaviors, which would include suicidal things. And there are about 70 cases like that. Now, the company disputes whether there's any cause and effect between the pill and these adverse effects, but, but they do occur. Now, the syrup does contain some sorbitol, so if you happen to not be able to tolerate fructose, you might have some issues with this kind of medicine. And it seems like the Tamiflu might reduce the likelihood that your body's going to produce antibodies to the flu. So if you're exposed at some later time, if you took it prophylactically, well, you might actually get the flu. It seems that there's no problem with overdose, but there are some rare side effects, some swelling of the tongue or the face or arrhythmias or hepatitis or hallucinations or seizures that can develop. And some people become confused or they lose their appetite or have nightmares. We know if you have kidney disease, you might have to reduce the dose that you take. And we know that if you happen to have liver disease, it doesn't seem to make much difference. How effective is the drug? Well, if you have the flu and you take it within that 48-hour window, then it might reduce the duration of your symptoms by a maximum of about one and a quarter days, but it might only reduce them by about half a day. Well, that's not very impressive, actually. And if we look at the absolute decrease in the likelihood that you're going to have problems, it only decreases the likelihood by somewhere between 1 and 12%. Now, you hear a lot of 
reports that people bandy about, oh, it's 60%, 70%, 80% effective. Uh -uh. Nowhere near. It acts on a chemical on the virus known as noraminidase, and it prevents that noraminidase from interacting with another chemical known as sialic acid to allow the viral particles to spread beyond the cell. Well, it's actually a prodrug. So the drug itself isn't effective, is not effective. You have to metabolize it in the body to another drug, and that related drug is effective, apparently. Well, how effective is it potentially if we just look in the laboratory? Well, you have to realize that there's the potential for resistance. It seems to work best for type A flu, but even against type A flu, the resistance rate is anywhere between about 3 and 30 percent. It varies seasonally, it varies with the geography. If we look at 2008, most of the cases were resistant to the Tamiflu, but 2009, most of them were sensitive to the drug. Peer is safe if you're breastfeeding, peer is safe if you are pregnant. For older people, it doesn't seem to be especially dangerous, but depending on the strain of the flu, depending on the virulence of the flu, and the susceptibility pattern, well, uh, that interacts with whether the drug is going to do its job. And remember, it will not prevent bacterial infections, and often early on, bacterial infections in the flu are confused. Well, if you look at some of the studies that are published in the medical literature, there's a problem with them because Number one, most of them are the influenza type A. And if you look at the people who were included, so during the flu season, the people were studied. They have a temperature elevation of at least 100 degrees or more. They have at least one respiratory symptom, maybe a stuffy nose, runny nose, cough, sore throat, and at least one systemic symptom. So they have either chills or fever or sweats or fatigue or muscle aches, headache. But only two-thirds of those people with all of those symptoms in the flu season really have the flu. The companies have an uh, imperative only to let positive information come out of the studies. So not all of the medical studies are actually published. A lot of them are kept secret, kept in lock and key, not available to the general public and not available to some of the regulatory agencies. So as a result, the studies that are out there paint a far rosier picture than actually is accurate. So much so that in 2005, a professor at Stanford School of Medicine, John Ionides, he published an article and said, the, the title of the article is Why Most Published Research Findings Are False. Well, there have been several studies done, several studies from, for instance, from the Cochrane Group. And the Cochrane Group says that if you take the vaccine within that 48-hour window, we know at least a third of the people aren't going to have the flu, but the people without the flu and the people with the flu seem to do equally as well. So there's a problem with some of these studies. Originally, when the drug first came out, the company advertised it and said that it would decrease hospitalizations by two-thirds, decrease the likelihood of complications, sinusitis, pneumonia, bronchitis by, again, two-thirds, and decrease the likelihood of death from the flu. But when the FDA studied the information available, they said, you don't have any evidence to prove that. Well, remember, if you take the Tamiflu and you get in within that 48-hour time window, the benefit might be anywhere between half a day of improvement and a day and a quarter of improvement. And if you take it prophylactically for up to about six weeks, you might be able to prevent the flu. So in general society, you go down from 5% down to 1%, and if you happen to live in a household where somebody has the flu, you could reduce the likelihood that you get the flu from, say, 12% down to 1%. Who's most benefited? We don't really know, but, but the suggestion is that hospitalized individuals, young children, women who are pregnant, people who are over age 65, Native Americans, Alaskan Eskimos, they might receive the most benefit from taking the medicine. Now, the German government, their official guidelines say the, don't take the drug. Center for Disease Control takes a nuanced approach. They say, geez, we don't want too much of the drug out there, especially prophylactically, because it might increase the likelihood of resistance. And resistance is a problem with any of these medicines targeting bugs of some sort, whether they're viruses or bacteria. 
Well, Centers for Disease Control comes out and they say that it can prevent complications, hospitalization, and maybe death, but they're only looking at the studies in the published literature, most of which are observational studies. The Food and Drug Administration, on the other hand, looks at carefully done medical studies, we call them double-blind placebo-controlled studies, and they don't show the drug is all that effective. As a matter of fact, there was one study on an intravenous norimidase inhibitor, and remember, the Tamiflu is an oral norimidase inhibitor. So this is intravenous medicine in hospitalized patients, 400 hospitalized patients, who received a drug called Rapavad. And guess what? In the double-blind study, it was ineffective. Now, the governments throughout the world, special governments in the United Kingdom, United States, Australia, Canada, and Israel started stockpiling the drug, spent billions and billions of dollars on the drug after 2005 when they thought that maybe we were going to have severe flu. But the studies, like one in the journal PLOS1, looked at the claims and said, you know, the studies aren't really well designed, they aren't geared statistically to show what benefit you might or might not get. So the studies are wrong. The Cochrane Group, 2006, again 2014, looked at the evidence and said, mm, we just don't really have the evidence that this stuff is really any good. And several studies have shown the benefits don't outweigh the risks. So how much Tamiflu do you need? Well, if you're going to take it for the disease, you take one pill twice a day, 10 days. Easy enough. If you're taking it prophylactically, you take half the dose, so you take one pill, and you can do that for up to six weeks. Or maybe if you're immunosuppressed, you could take it for 12 weeks. Consideration is that you have a 48-hour window. So in that 48-hour window, you have to develop the symptoms. You have to call the doctor's office. You have to get into the doctor's office. That obviously has some cost associated with it. And then you have to go over to the pharmacy. And then you have to go and buy the drug, some cost associated with that. There's time associated with all of this. And then you're exposing everyone in the doctor's office, everyone in the pharmacy to the flu. And on top of that, if you're talking about going to the emergency room, well, now instead of seeing the people with heart attacks and stroke, they're worried about somebody with the flu, which might not be the best use of the time. Is a drug expensive? It's moderately expensive. So if you buy the trade name, the Tamiflu, and you pay cash, it's about $180 for the 10 days worth. If you use a GoodRx coupon, it's a little bit less. It's now available in a generic product, and that's somewhat less expensive, but not all that inexpensive. So what's my take on the drug? Obviously, it's much too expensive, and the effectiveness is questionable. Anyway, thanks for watching. I'm Dr. Ken Landau.